Yeah, hi, I'm Stephen Clark. I've been coming to Unley Park for about 30 years. Uh, last, about 80 months ago, I gave a little presentation about this photo memorial board. It's got uh, pictures of about 30, 34 exactly um, Unley Park Baptist Church soldiers. Um, and amongst them are four soldiers that died in the First World War. In this photo memorial board, they're noted by a dark ring around they're cut out, except there are two that didn't get the dark uh, rings around them. Uh, Mr. Fairburn and Mr. Clark, no relation, didn't get the black circles. And Jason's asked me to concentrate on one particular person, and I'm going to concentrate on this fella, handsome young chap. His name is uh, Robert Goldthorpe Rawls, and he's name, uh, known as Goldie. Now, I'll show you the four um, soldiers that died from Unley Park in the brass plaque in the church. Yeah, now we're in the main auditorium or the sanctuary of the church, and at the front left-hand side of the church is a couple of um, brass plaques. The top one just has the four uh, soldiers that died in the First World War. That's uh, uh, Andrew Clark, you know, Ed Fairburn, Goma Maslin, and uh, Goldie Rawls. The bottom plaque has the other um, 30 plus soldiers and interestingly a couple of nurses that uh, went to the First World War so the names aren't exactly the same as the photo memorial board there's a couple of extra people a couple of different people but it includes the, the ladies on this board yeah now we're in the walkway near the kitchen at the back of the church where there are pictures of all the previous um, former um, Unley Park senior pastors and that includes Reverend J, uh, J. G. Rawls, John, I think, Garrard Rawls. He was the senior pastor between 1909 and 1913, just prior to the First World War. Then he moved on to Flinders Street Baptist Church and he was a pastor there, senior pastor there for quite a while. You know, that, as I said, um, Reverend Rawls had three sons, all went up to the, signed up for the First World War and one younger daughter didn't do that. Two of them, Goldie and Alec, died in the First World War both in the same area within about a month, near Poziers in the Somme area of the France. People may think I'm just focused on one area like the First World War, but I've got a broader range of interests. There's the Second World War, the Vietnam War, and of course, the Civil War in America. Yeah, I'd like to read a letter, part of a letter that Alec Rawls wrote to a friend of his, he wrote for a Melbourne newspaper. How do we think of home? and laugh at the pettiness of our little day, daily annoyances. We could not sleep, we remember, because of the creaking of the pantry door, or the noise of the tram cars, or the kids playing around and making a row. Well, we can't now sleep now because six shells are bursting around here every minute. You can't get much sleep between them. Guns are belching out shells with the most thunderous clap each time. The ground is shaking with each little explosion. I am wet. The ground on which I rest is wet. My feet are cold. In fact, I'm all cold with my two skimpy blankets. I'm covered with cold, clotted sweat, and sometimes my person is foul. I'm hungry. I'm annoyed because of the absurdity of war. I can see no chance of anything better for tomorrow or the day after or the year after. Now, as we face these uncertain times at the moment, strange times indeed, with the coronavirus, we just reflect on the um, challenges faced by people like the people on this uh, memorial board, including um, Goldie Rawls, Goldie and Alec, both lost their lives in the First World War. Just think of their sacrifice um, and also the challenges they face and reflect on that as we face the stay-at-home challenges served. at the moment defending freedom, their bravery and dedication, their love for our country, their humour, their resourcefulness and their hope. We remember daughters and sons, wives and husbands, mothers and fathers who served in times of war. Lord, we remember, we honour, we are grateful for them. 
Help us to hold the freedom that we have close. May we use it wisely so that many may live in harmony, in safety, with respect, with confidence and hope. Our Lord, we remember them. And this we pray in the name of the one who gave his life for the sake of the world, our Lord Jesus. Amen. As we begin our time together, we want to sing about a God of kindness and love. I think in the face of all the unkindness and the evils that happen in our lives and our world, we need to know that this God is for us.
blessings that you have poured out on us as we remember sacrifice for Anzac Day. We also remember the sacrifice that your son made, the one that died for us, the many. Um, And just pray that uh, in this time of remembrance um, and solitude, that you would be our focus as well, Lord, that uh, you would come into our homes, into our hearts and really fill us with your presence.
everyone. Another experiment for today. Frankie and Esther are helping me. We did this the other day. Yeah, and it was like, it was a bit colourful. It was, it was really good. And it made me think of how we need to read the Bible. Now, at first glance, the Bible might seem a bit plain and boring. Some people say, oh, it's just an old book, and they haven't even read it. Um, there are no pictures and... Some people might think it's, it's just a whole lot of old rules, but there are actually some really exciting stories in the Bible. There are mm, love stories, there are spies. What else, I see? Um, battles. Battles, epic battles. There are lions. Lions and hideaways and secrets. Yeah, definitely secrets. Amazing miracles. There are there are miracles. There's friendship stories. There's lessons. And so there's stuff even in the Bible that your parents probably don't want you watching on TV. Now, if you read these stories on their own, you might be, oh, wow, thinking that's that's pretty colourful, that's pretty amazing, that's, that's changed me. But we need to get more out of the Bible. God wants us to really appreciate his word. Um, the Bible is living and active and, and can really act in us. So what we need is we've got some patience here. So dip, dip in to get some patience. We don't always understand the Bible straight away, and sometimes we need we need a bit of patience. What else? We've got some we've got some hunger. What did Jeremiah say? What did Jeremiah do with the, the word of God? He ate it then. <laughs> it's like that Colin song. Feed on the word of God. Um, Jeremiah said the the word of God is his his joy and his heart's heart's delight. Uh, we also need um, listening ears. Sometimes the Bible is hard to understand, but we need to be ready to listen to it, even if it's even if it's something we we perhaps don't want to hear. So we've got, and really important, we need prayer. So Frankie, what do we do before we read the Bible? We pray. And what do we need to ask? To God? help to give us wisdom when we read it. Yeah, pray and ask God to help us understand. Now, when you do these things. Wow, the Bible really starts to come alive. Um, and then you need time. Just hold it and you don't even have to have to read it all at once. You can just spend time in one part of the Bible and it keeps moving around and it links in with other parts. And then we start reading more of the Bible and we find another story. Don't mix. And we can just stay and experience all the things that God is trying to tell us through his word. And it becomes alive and living and, and really amazing. So what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to pray. Dear God, thank you for your Bible. It's a gift to us. Thank you for the stories that Jesus told. Thank you for the stories that happened and the things that happened all those years before Jesus was born. Thank you for the prophecies that um, came true. Thank you for your promises. And thank you that we can read your Bible and your word whenever we want to. Please help us have wisdom to understand it. Please help us have listening ears. And please help these kids all have a hunger for your word. Amen. So this is another experiment that you might like to do at home. Do you want to, Esther, do you want to tell everyone how to do it? Um, you need detergent and food coloring and milk and a plate. Yeah. Um, and you'll need maybe cotton, cotton parts, like three or two. Yeah. Two. Um, and you'll need two sack of thingies, which I don't know what they're called. Yeah. 
and food dye. Yeah. You put the um cotton bud in the yeah. um, detergent, then put it in. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Introduce yourselves. Well, I am uh, Simon Davis. I'm the youth pastor at the church that used to be uh, functioning, uh, now online, um, and Camilla, my wife. That's right. You have one more. And we've got William. He's sleeping at the moment. A little yeah. uh, 14 month year old child. Yeah. Yeah. That little 1.3 meter 14 month year old. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, Camilla. Like I, like I said before, uh, I haven't. I've seen Simon most weeks, uh, well, every week, but I haven't seen you for some time. So, how are you going? How's young William going? Because he's uh, fourteen months old, and also included in there. What's it meant for you? This whole social, this whole physical isolation. What does that mean for you? Um. Yeah, I've been missing everyone. Missing you, Jason. Missing everyone at church. Um. We're doing well. William is doing well too. He learnt how to walk and now he learnt how to run and he's running everywhere, um, falling a lot. He just had a really bad fall the other day. He fell onto the corner of the cupboard and he had a massive bruise. So it's been interesting. <laughs> he sounds like uh, his father. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So yeah, we've been we've been doing all right. It's being a bit chaotic keeping William inside um, because he's very active. We used to go to the playground all the time, and I used to just try and, for my sake as well, just to get out of the house and and socialize, so I could also feel more of a human being, I guess. And it's yeah. just been very tricky now with this isolation thing and not being able to see anyone catch up with anyone so i've been trying to come up with ideas just to get myself entertained and get william busy as well inside the house so it's been interesting to just find different ways to get distracted around the house with him so yeah we've been doing lots of walks like three or four times a day <laughs> yeah. But, yeah now camilla um you obviously are from Brazil, and it must concern you, uh, given that not only are you far away, but uh, your country may not have the same level of medical care as ours. So, just tell us about how how you how is your family in Brazil, and um, about your concerns if you have any for uh, your country. Yeah, uh, so Brazil is definitely not doing well, like we are doing here. They are. Um, some people don't even believe that there is a virus, so they're just not caring and they're doing, they're taking it all as a political matter. So they're just literally doing um, protests and everything around the street, even though we're meant to be in isolation. So the cases in Brazil have gone up so much. They've got over 50,000 cases and they've had nearly 3,500 deaths which wow. is quite scary because um, our health, the, the, the public health in Brazil is not good. So if you do need to go to the hospital, you just don't have any access to anything there. So it does concern me a lot, um, especially because, um, yeah, I know that if my parents or anyone from my family needs some sort of help, they just can't get anything from the hostels. Mm. So it's quite yeah. scary to... And we also meant to, we were meant to be going to Brazil now. And we had to postpone our trip to November. We don't even know if we're going to make it anyway. But um, it's quite scary to not even know if I'll be able to see everyone alive when I get there because I've got grandparents and um, grand grandmas. And it's just quite scary to think that they might not be alive when I go mm -hmm. there. So... Yeah, we've been praying a lot and it does concern me a lot. I know we're doing really well in Australia. I'm very glad about it, but it's just scary to think about my whole family that's not here and they're not able to access this good health that we have here. And 
Yeah. Yes. And uh, your, your sister as well, isn't, isn't she a paramedic or she's trained to be a paramedic? Yeah, she's um, starting to be a dentist. So she, I her, think right. her uni's not, is not, um, she's not having classes anymore, which is good because she used to have sort of like a friendship at uni. So she used to see patients every single day. Um, so I'm glad she's not doing that. But she, but yeah, she's, she's still working. She's got a job. She's a um, public servant. So she, she's still going to work. But at least he's not in the health um, area, so mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Camilla. We're going to pray about that as we close. But Simon, before we get to that, um, bring us up to speed on what youth group has been doing and our young adults, given that we can't meet together on our Friday nights and Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've still been gathering. Just everything's uh, changed to online. So for the young adults, we've got. Um, uh, just our normal growth groups, and that's just over a video chat like this. Um, and for our youth group, we've actually started, uh, uh, it's called YouthTube. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, you can look us up at um, UPBC uh, Youth. Uh, and basically what we do is we, we have a video, like a, a talk, and, and try our best to create some games there, um, just like we would at normal youth group. We'd have some you know fun stuff and then, and then a talk, some content. And then we normally meet together in small groups, break off on the Friday. And now we've just been doing that over WhatsApp. So again, just a video chat mode. So we've tried our best to, to kind of mimic and recreate and even try some new things that youth didn't have before. So uh, it's been a challenge, but um, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Yeah, no, um, you should check out the, the uh, YouTube channel because uh, it, it's quite fun and the youth leaders in particular are being quite creative and we see Simon also being very creative so it's worth worth checking out um, checking out the channel uh, now on Friday night you you had a family night tell us about that so I thought because we've got all of our families at home or just so many more people at home at least and everyone's kind of together I thought uh, for a little bit of a change, instead of doing small groups uh, with leaders and other youth, we could uh, watch some content to engage our family as a small group and, I guess, grow in faith together and, and just open up some conversations that we often don't seem to have with the people that we live uh, in most uh, close proximity to. So I just, yeah, thought that um, switch it around a bit and, and, and have families connect this week. Mm, very good. If um, What should we pray for in terms of our young adults, our youth, and you in your role? Uh, I guess just that we uh, continue to uh, make it fun and, and creative. Uh, I think that there's a bit of a challenge not knowing. Um, you, put, you put a video up and it goes out. You don't really know how it's received. So, um, yeah, just continual wisdom and creativity on... Uh, mine and the youth leaders part um, and also just so our youth social media over the platforms we have um, there's not that necessary um, you're not in the same room as each other so it's a lot more voluntary the amount of connection they have so just that they would uh, feel really supported and comfort each other um, and really use kind of what we've tried to create uh, to connect and, and bond over. So, yeah, just helping us do what we, um, we're we trying to do and do it well and do it to God's glory and that the youth feel really supported and um, really connected. Thanks for what you're doing, Simon. Uh, we love you. We love you both. And uh, it's really terrific to see you, Camilla. Um, let's, let's pray together, churches, as uh, we've just heard from Simon and Camilla. Father, we thank you that... Uh, that you are at work in this family, uh, that, Lord, that you've had your hand on little William as he grows up and uh, you're giving Camilla creativity in how to be a mother and get the space she needs. Uh, Lord, we want to particularly rem remember Camilla's family and the country of Brazil. As she's drawn attention uh, to this, we understand that they don't have necessarily the the infrastructure, uh, the, even the culture to um, 
approach this coronavirus in a way that could can just contain it. And we would seriously pray that you have, might have mercy upon this whole nation. And I think of Camilla and, and her, no doubt, heavy heart. I mean, she spoke of something that's quite sobering, not knowing if she could see her own family members again. Uh, well, Lord, we'd, we'd ask that you'd have mercy on them, just like you'd have mercy on all those people that are loved. And uh, God, uh, help Help Camilla know that you hear her prayers as she brings that to you. Thank you for Simon's work with our youth and our young adults. And we do pray, God, that you'd use this time to grow us all in faith. And we think about the efforts that Simon and the teams are making. Give them creativity and energy. Uh, help them know whether they're on the right track. Uh, but help their efforts grow people in following Jesus. And I, I pray for our youth and young adults. Uh, they are really affected. Some of them can't work. Uh, some of them have to do schooling in a different way. Some of them are doing year 12 and, and one of the most uncertain years that we've ever had. So we would pray, Lord, that you might be at work in them and uh, that you might also use them to support their own friends and their school communities, their uh, the communities that they're part of. So God, uh, thank you again for the family and we pray a blessing on the Davises. Uh, may they have much joy even in this challenge and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for dropping in. Missing Good to see you. All. Yeah, Catch we missed you too. Catch ya. All right. Thanks, church. I'll just... Very good. All right. Well, we're um, really glad that we could see the Davises. Um, but uh, we're going to take up our off. Well, we're going to pray for our offering now. And on this Sunday of the month, we receive our offering for City Bible Forum. So if you could make a contribution to the City Bible Forum's efforts, they, they support us with the work that we have uh, so, sorry, they support us as we work in our workplaces. Um, you can do that online or through direct transfer. But we're going to sing uh, as we come into the sermon, Speak, O Lord.
got a Bible reading from Jasmine Howard this week. Hopefully it works. My name is Jasmine and today I will be reading from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the temple of the Lord. Jerusalem, we are standing at your gates. Jerusalem is, is built as a city where friends can come together. The people from the tribes go up there. The tribes belong to the Lord. It is the rule to praise the Lord at Jerusalem. There the descendants of David set their thrones to judge the people. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May those who love her be safe. May there be peace within her walls and safety within her strong towers. To help my relatives and friends, I repeat, let Jerusalem have peace. For the sake of the temple of the Lord, our God, I wish good for her. Here I am, it's an empty hall. As we go through the whole church, the whole church has been an empty building for about five weeks. On Sundays, we'd all be here, gathered in our spots, saying hello to the people that we know. We'd, if we stuck around, we'd go out the back and have some coffee and tea together and chat. I think on any one Sunday, you might meet five to 10 people just running into each other chatting as you walk up the steps at the front of the church, as you sit down, uh, as you walk out. Some of you take forever to get out of this auditorium. But none of that's happened for five weeks. I wonder what it means for us to be a church now. Now that we don't meet in a building, now that we don't run into each other, now that if we want to catch up, we have to call each other or organise it, make it happen. I wonder what it means for us to be a church without a building. But I wonder what it means for us to build community without this gathering point, this location, our geography. These are pretty tricky questions. I'm going to put them out to you. What does it mean to be church now that we do not have a building? How do we build community, that sense of togetherness, now that we don't see each other? How can we do that? Very good. Well, I would love it if you could respond to those questions in the chat. So uh, what does it mean to be a church and how do we build community? If you have some thoughts on that, then why not put that into the chat and we will not only be able to see it right now, but we'll be able to collect it and re reflect on it later. It is a challenging time for our church. I think our church, given its size, won't be able to gather together in this room for some months. I'd be quite surprised if it's before, say, October, November, but we'll see. Things have been going well, and we're very grateful for that. But if we can't gather in this building, what does it mean for us to be Unley Park Baptist Church? What does it mean when so much of our church life is tied to meeting together? When the Hebrews were going through tough times and they had a good reason to not meet together, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Meeting together has always been a high priority for the people of God. And they will do what they can to meet wherever they can. I mean, we know of the underground church in China, but throughout the world, people have tried to meet together to encourage one another in faith. And we've met together, and in fact, this would be 
probably the only time in all of our history that we've had such a prolonged um, time when we haven't been able to connect. Our church community is shaped by our gatherings. I mean, uh, the building has this feel to it. Uh, I've noticed that people behave a certain way when they're in this building. It's slight, It's a f- more formal building. We have a pipe organ, kind of more traditional. So it means that folk, generally speaking, are uh, a bit more muted, even when they're in this room. It is, uh, we don't blacken out the, uh, the windows. We don't have lights uh, to shine on the stage. So that, that all influences our culture and the way we are as community. I said already that we sit in the same spot, generally speaking. There are the rebels who move around, uh, the one or two or three rebels, but mostly people sit in the same spot, which means that you get to connect with the same people and you start to build friendship and connection. You notice when somebody's not here, well, we, we don't have that anymore. So what does it mean? What does it mean for us to be a church while we can't meet together? I wonder, let me just have a check on the chat now to see if there's any uh, comments here. Church is family, Sally says, and we love through people from God to others here and everywhere. Uh, so is that, there's something here. I can't see many more things, but I'm sure you'll keep it coming. I know that even though we can't meet in the building we still gather. I mean, right now we're gathering uh, in, in a form, aren't we? But we're, we're scattered across the city, and I'm increasingly finding out we're scattered across our country and even the globe, and we meet together for worship and to hear from God's word. So we still can gather. And in many ways, this way of meeting has a different way of building community. So numbers of folk are really grateful for the chat, the ability to affirm and encourage. And somebody asked me, how could we do that when we come back in person? I'm, I'm not sure if I want everyone just heads down on their devices typing out chat uh, comments, but it's something to take on board. How can we keep that sense of dynamic contribution? Most of our growth groups have learned to connect through technology. They've done mostly, I think, Zoom, but some do WhatsApp and others do Google Hangouts. So we can still gather. By the way, I think with the growth groups, we may be unlikely to have gatherings of 250, uh, 250 people, but I can see that it won't be too long before groups of 10 may be able to gather. So I think our growth groups will be able to connect together in person before we can come together as a worship community, which is interesting. It puts more responsibility, I'd suggest, and opportunity on our growth groups. And I'd encourage you to think about participating in one uh, sooner rather than later if you're not already connected. But here's something that amuses me. Uh, About six weeks ago, if your teenager or your young adult was sitting on Facebook all the time, and uh, chatting through FaceTime and uh, only texting their friends and never going down the street to visit them, what, what would you have said to them? You would have said, get out of the house, go see real people. Uh, and here we are. We're just like the teenagers that we were criticising six weeks ago. And teenagers, please rub that in. It's only fair. But now we're all behaving like they were six weeks ago. We don't necessarily go and see each other anymore. We're Zooming our meetings and friendships and Facebook becomes more important to us. And what we would have said six weeks ago is you can have connection in those forms of technology, but are you building community? And I think it's a valid comment because right now, in a sense, we are connecting, getting to speak to you, you're getting to listen, um, but is that community? Is that a place where if, see, I think a test of community is if somebody doesn't come, we notice. We notice when somebody's missing. We notice when somebody hurts. And that's a test of community. Um, and are we, are we able to do that in this virtual space when people are not seen? 
So are they not in front of mind? And that's something I think we, over the next few weeks we want to keep building is how do we not just have connection but also keep building community. Of course as well, while we can't meet in the building, we can still grow in following Jesus. Uh, the challenging times highlight the importance of faith. I've heard it repeated over and over again from followers of Jesus. They say, I don't know how anybody is getting through this without faith. Because a follower of Jesus can be encouraged by positive words from the scripture, can pray and bring their anxieties and their concerns to God, can know that they can call a friend who's a follower of Jesus and share what's on their heart and have them pray with them. So faith in challenging times really comes to the fore. I also know that there's been an increase in personal responsibility because you have a sense that you can't connect together so much, people are engaging their Bibles more, journaling. These are good things. I know as well that families are taking a more proactive approach in discipling their children and their teenagers and their household. All of this is excellent because it lists our capacity to grow in following Jesus. Um, we have this Bible app and it's called U Version, and I think about a, a bunch of people are reading a Bible plan together. I've only just caught up. I got behind some uh, over a couple of weeks, so I've just caught up. But every day I've been so encouraged by comments that other folk have made as they've read a passage and reflected on it, and then they've pushed that out. And I've been really encouraged by sharing in that. I know that uh, coming into Jesus the Game Changer People will have an opportunity to watch the Game Changer videos and then meet together as growth groups, and they'll encourage each other in faith. And, and what I think is excellent about the kind of Zoom effect is I've noticed, for me at least, it sharpens my conversation. Because you have to be a bit quiet. You can't all talk at the same time. Everyone has to take their turn. You give a more considered response. So it's made me, believe it or not, more careful when I'm uh, speaking on uh, video chats. And that's a good thing too. I've uh, seen that we've been able to talk to more people, have less travel time, have more focus uh, in our conversations. These are all good. And these are all things that are helping us grow to follow Jesus. But there is this challenge in that as well. Because some of this becomes quite convenient. You, you right now, you can get up at say 9.45, get your bowl of cereal, in your pyjamas, you can be sitting watching us uh, speak and t lead you through this service today. That is super convenient. By about 10 past 11, we'll be done, you can have your, your barista style coffee and be on to the next thing. And I, I will say this, that when we are back in person, I don't know if, well, we can't be that efficient. You won't be able to bring your bowl of cereal here and be in your pyjamas and be done by 11.10 back off to do your power walk around the neighbourhood. You won't be, it'll take a lot longer than that. And so this is a convenience thing. But the problem with convenience sometimes is it means that it's not so core to us. And I, I'd hate to think that that, happens for us, that this becomes one convenient time slot. Our time of gathering as community is a, a really tight time slot in our lives, not core. That with church being out of sight, it becomes increasingly out of mind. While we can't meet in the building, we can still care for one another. And all of our usual forms of caring have been utterly hammered by this challenge. We normally like to do community, to get together and talk and, uh, and look after each other. And the other thing we like to do is we like to cook and bring a meal around. And these two things are things we cannot do. So this way of caring, I've noticed, is requiring much more personal contact. We can't meet in groups of people, so we're having to ring more one-to-one. -one. It is requiring, I've noticed that the prayer network that we have has lifted. 
Um, so more personal contact, more expressiveness on the prayer needs that we have, and I, I've also noticed it's required more creativity. So we've had to think of other ways of supporting people that are not so familiar to us. As a church, we can still serve, but there are less rosters. This morning, we have 10 people. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 10 people in the room. That's it. We had to roster 10 people or so, plus the three that are helping out in the hosting. But there are a lot less rosters, and many of us would be super glad about that. Um, but if, if there's less rosters, it means that our service requires more personal initiative. You got to, you, we see a need, you're not rostered on to meet the need now, uh, which is simpler in a way. You actually have to make initiative, take initiative to meet the need. And our service requires creativity. I think there are different kinds of opportunities. Uh, we, I, I've, I've mentioned for a few weeks about tech support because there are people who can't connect because the technology skills are beyond them. But there are, there are folk who are now happy to be available to call someone to pray for them over, over, the, over the phone. We're seeing more letters being posted, more cards being sent. Uh, these are all things that in the past probably weren't core to us, but now we're discovering are really important. And as a church, we still share our faith uh, in Jesus with others. I've been so encouraged that people have invited family and friends to join us at this on online service. And if you're, you are joining us today because somebody's invited you, then a special welcome to you. I do think that in a time of heightened need, when we have such a security and hope in Jesus, that we have something that we can share with others. And I, I, I know that many of us find that quite difficult, but I su suspect we've had more opportunities in the last five weeks than maybe other times. Because you do have hope and security in Jesus. You do have something to share with others. And there are creative opportunities, I think, to connect with our community. Uh, and, you know, we tried a little thing with encouraging teachers. But I'm, I'm, I'm on the lookout for any opportunity to connect with our community's needs and to serve them. Which brings me to the psalm that Jasmine read, Psalm 122. Because Psalm 122, when you first hear it, sounds like it's about the temple or about the church. You know, it, it was good to me to let us... I rejoice with those who said to me, Psalm, 1, Psalm 122 verse 1 says, Let us go to the house of the Lord. This psalm kicks off and it's about worship and going as the gathered believers to worship together. Interesting thing for me is as you read the psalm, it goes very quickly from being about the temple to actually talking about the city Jerusalem and uh, reflecting on what that city means. Now, Jerusalem is a holy city. Uh, it was holy then and it still is considered a holy city. It's a place where pilgrims go uh, to experience holiness. But it's not just that. And I wanna, want us to notice what this psalm draws us to in the relationship between the temple and the city. Because Jerusalem in this psalm holds all the attention. These pilgrims, they look around. It's almost like they're standing at the gate of Jerusalem, looking out at this city, and they see its walls. They see its scale. They remember its history, and they remember how important this city is. In verse 2, if you have your Bibles, look with me at this. It's verse 2. They arrive at the city, and they stand at city gates, and they look around. In verse 3, it says that they see its gates, its walls, its towers, 
and they have a sense of its strength and its security. In verse 4, they reflect that the whole nation, all of its 12 tribes, they all come here, that this city is a center of importance for everybody. And they all come here to praise God and to walk in his ways. Verse 5, they remember that the city is where the kings rule. The kings descended from David. And here the kings make judgments and they settle arguments. Verse 6, they pray for peace. The peace and prosperity of this city. They pray for its security. They pray for its prosperity in verse 9. And verse 9 is the one I want to draw out in particular. Because it says this. For the sake of... Of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. For the sake of the temple, they want the city to do well. Because they understand that the temple they love is in the city they love. And if the city doesn't do well, then the temple won't do well. And if the temple doesn't do well, then the city won't do well. I understand that these two things need to work together. If I was to turn it into our modern day language, I'd say that the city needs to prosper and the church needs to prosper too for everyone to do well in life. We know that when the exile came in 587 BC, we know that when the city failed to be obedient to God and when the rulers ignored God, and the priests ignored God. In other words, the city didn't prosper and the temple didn't prosper. We know that both failed terribly. There was an exile, and it was the whole city and its temple were destroyed. I want to remind us of this at this time, that we are experiencing this reality. Because our world is under duress, we are isolated. Because people have challenge in our city, we have challenge. We're, we're like this, not because the government forced us to, but because everyone is suffering. And it's really important for us to understand that the church we love is in the city we love. And what happens to the city we love and the nation and the families and the people that we are surrounded by is happening to us too. So what does it mean for us to be church? That was the question I asked. Well, it does mean all these things about meeting together and encouraging one another. And it means that we are present in our city for their good too. You see, one of my concerns as I've looked at the way I spend my time and also the way that we talk about things of faith as churches and as leaders is I've been concerned how much our conversation has been about ourselves and not so much about others, about what will we do now that our church can't get together and worship How do we get online church to work well? How do we gather as growth groups? How can we read our Bibles and be accountable together? And those are all super important. But it seems to me that because the city is not doing well, neither are we. And I think that the call of this time is not that we be prophets in our society, And we know that sometimes our society needs the church to be a prophet to call out error and injustice. But I don't think that is this time. I think our society needs us to be pastors, needs us to be carers, needs us to be servers. You know, I I was reading about Alec Raw. You remember him? Alec Raw is from the very first video at the start. And when the war broke out, Alec Rawls declared his hatred for the idea of the blood and the cruelty and the suffering that war could bring. He hated war. But he ended up 
deciding to go serve because he had this strong sense of duty for his family, for his brother who was serving already, and he believed, and this is to quote him, that the only hope for the salvation of the world is a speedy victory for the Allies. So he served because he knew that until society did well and was free from this war, nothing would move forward. So he served with his life at the cost of his life for the sake of those he loved, his family, his friends, and his country. He used his life to serve these and that's the spirit I'm talking of. That it, What does it mean for us to be church in this time? I hope it means that we do use our time and our talents, and we're going to need a lot of those things, to serve the city we love, the neighbourhoods we love, the nation we love. Because their future is our future. Their security is our security. Their concerns are our concerns. Their hopes are our hopes. These are shared things between us. I need to remind us all, that's exactly how Jesus has helped us in the world. He didn't isolate himself. He didn't watch from afar and wave a magic wand and it all got better. Jesus got involved. What was of great significance and challenge to us became of significance and challenge to him. He came close to us. How can we do that as a church? How can we meet the world, the city, the families, the friends that we love with the service and care? How can it not be just good for us but good for the world that we're living in too? As I close now, I want you to think of the family and friends, our nation and its leaders. Think of all these dear, precious people. Think of our world. We've mentioned briefly Brazil. But think of the, just the dreadful suffering that our world is under now. What does your heart do? When you think of these things, as you turn outwards, what does your heart do? What I'd like to do is invite one person in your house to pray. To pray for these people. To pray that our church might be a blessing and a help to those in need. I'd like to offer you a time, and I'm going to ask Chris to come and play. And then I'm going to close, just in prayer. Why don't you pray in your house now? If you are by yourself, what you could do is you could pray, of course, but you could share that prayer on the chat as well. Let's pray together.
our Lord God. Our church, church we love. is placed in this city among the people we love. And we are placed in this state in this nation on this planet. Help us to love our city. Help us to love those around us. Help us to not just have the great news of Jesus and this extraordinary life that he gives for ourselves. Now God, I pray that Our church might be good for the world you love. Indeed, I can see how right now our futures are tied together. There is no isolating ourselves from all of this. And so we want to say amen to the prayers that folk have prayed in their homes. I want to say amen to the prayers that folk have chatted, uh, typed up in the chat. And we pray, our God, that as we keep moving into this year that has been so challenging, you might help us be creative, help us be courageous, that you might give us opportunities to love our city. This we ask. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for meeting with us this morning. Uh, I'm going to invite the band back up. What I would like to say as we finish up is I read the fine print of our c- copyright. And discovered that we are allowed to have the full service on things like YouTube and Facebook. So uh, please know that if you go to our channels, then you'll be able to see the full service, including songs, which is what we were cutting out. I'll be at the front of the church. Give me a few minutes. Often I need to pack some things away, but I'll be at the front of the service at the end. If you want to meet with me on Facebook Live, it would be fantastic if you do connect just to share some of your thoughts about Uh, Psalm 122, and how we can love our city, those around us as well. I want to sing a really fantastic, fun song, which is about uh, all of creation worshipping Jesus. Uh, Let's uh, sing as we close.
May the Lord's blessing be on you. May you know peace, and may peace be established in our city, in our friends, in our families. Hold fast to what is right. Dwell in the love of God, for love is the greatest thing of all. And go now to love and to serve our Lord. Go in peace. Amen.